There is. <laughs> Good evening. Um, on November 27th, five of you met, and this was a Brown Act violation. I'm here to ask you in closed session to ask for Trustee Acosta to step down from the board. She was the one who brought all five of you together, therefore I hold her responsible. This is strange to me because for the last two years, she has been very asocial on this board. For the first six months, she sat in this seat over here and looked at the wall. Didn't interact, wasn't involved. She was on no committees. Did not meet with the superintendent. Did not attend closed session meetings. And left by 1030 even when the board's business was not concluded. She missed 16 meetings in two years, roughly 40% of the meetings. That's more than I missed in 11 years. At times, she even worked on personal stuff while the board was in, ses set in session. So why was she here? It sure did not seem to be for the students. The only thing I could see that she was here for was to have two knee operations, two knee replacements, and a cataract surgery. So I have filed a Brown Act violation with the district attorney, not with this board, which is the normal process, because five of the seven trustees were involved. So why waste my time going through that process? So I'm willing to pull that back from the district attorney, provided Trustee Acosta steps down tonight. I put this in your hands. Thank you. Public employee, oh, excuse me. Public employee appointment and the government quote is 54957. Classified public employee, empo public employee appointment, same thing. 2.4, public employee discipline dismissal re release leaves. 2.5, existing anticipated pending litigation. 2.6, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation. <laughs> I did not have to up. <laughs> um, so, as the president, I'm going to acknowledge with gratitude a $45,000 grant from the Monterey Peninsula Foundation for the El Sistema, which is a wonderful musical fabulous and we have in a couple of other schools now for the Valencia Elementary School. <laughs> and this this one's really good. <laughs> and we have an $85,000 grant from the Community Foundation Board of Directors for equipment for the Pajaro Valley High School athletic field which we're going to have. And the last one, yay! <laughs> that one is really good. One. <laughs> and the last one is a seven thousand dollar grant um, from the Community Foundation Board of Directors for raising a reader book bag program for our child development. This is really great. So now. Welcome back to the students, parents, and staff to the new calendar year and our second half of our instructional year. We're fortunate as educators, we actually have two new years, the calendar and then our school year. So over the weekend, I sent a thank you to staff to congratulate them on the incredible progress that we're making with our students as seen on our assessment measures of academic progress. Um, with the new initiatives, programs, and curriculums that we're implementing, we're making great progress, so thank you to everyone. So, bienvenidos estudiantes.
estudiantes, padres de familia personal al año nuevo y la segunda mitad de nuestro año escolar. Durante el fin de semana envié una nota de agradecimiento al personal para felicitarles a el increíble, increíble progreso que hemos, estamos haciendo con nuestros estudiantes que podemos ver en nuestra evaluación de medidas de progreso académico. Con las nuevas iniciativas, programas y currículum que, estamos, que hemos implementado, estamos haciendo gran progreso. So last week, I was able to spend we don't have a picture of it. Let's look at Twitter. Um, I was able to spend another day in the life of, this time as a bus driver. So I spent the morning with all the drivers during their dry run day as they received training in the traveling classroom and kept up to date on current driving laws. So la semana pasada, la semana pasada pude pasar otro día en la vida en esta vez en la vida de un conductor de autobús. So no tienen la foto, so pueden ver en, um, en mi de socio um, de um, Twitter. Y pasé la mañana con todos los conductores durante su día de organización de rutas mientras recibieron um, entrenamiento para mantenerse al día sobre las leyes actuales de conducta, conducción. In the afternoon, I completed a, a bus inspection and not personally drove the new route with one of our bus drivers, Artie Vargas. So Artie is a dedicated driver committed to his students and ensuring they start and end their day well. I always appreciate learning about our processes from multiple perspectives because I believe the more informed we are, the better decisions that we make. Por la tarde, completé una inspección de autobús y condu um, conduje no personalmente, a la nueva ruta con uno de nuestros conductores de autobús, Artie Vargas. Artie es un conductor dedicado, comprometido con sus estudiantes y garantiza que comiencen y terminen su bien su día. Siempre aprecio aprender sobre nuestros procesos desde múltiples per perspectivas. Creo que uh, mientras que estamos más informados, mejores decisiones que podemos tomar. I'm going to have governing board comments, and I'm going to start with Georgia. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone had a wonderful new year. My family and I certainly did, and we are really looking forward to this year. I want to take a moment and clarify a matter that was brought up at our last board meeting on December 12th. At that December 12th board meeting, it was suggested that I and our current board president, Karen Oskinson, held a discussion about board business with Daniel Dock Jr., Jennifer Holm, and Jennifer Lee Shocker, who are now all members of the board, and that all of those involved in that discussion were guilty of violating the Ralph M. Brown Act, which requires meetings of public bodies to be properly noticed and held in public. One member of our board suggested that a criminal investigation would be appropriate. Clearly, a violation of the Brown Act or of any other law by an elected official would be a serious matter. Even if such a violation of the law were inadvertent, that would still be a serious matter. Because that is true, I want to be sure, sure that there is a clear public statement that neither I nor Board Chair Osmondson nor any of the new board members violated the law. There was, in fact, a brief social gathering at Coffeeville in Watsonville shortly after 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, November 27th. I have consulted with an attorney on this matter who has had extensive experience with both elections law and the Brown Act and he has provided me with an opinion letter on this subject, confirming that no violation of the Brown Act took place. In retrospect, it is too bad that this gathering occurred. It was obviously misconstrued and mischaracterized. It is also too bad from my personal perspective that no one bothered to talk to me about the possibility that the gathering on November 27th took place in violation of the Brown Act prior to the public suggestion that I and other current board members violated the law. Such an unfounded suggestion undermines public confidence in this board and in each one of us as elected officials. I hope that by letting the public know that their elected officials did not break the law and that any suggestion that the gathering on November 27th was a violation of the Ralph M. Brown Act is simply not true. 
will help restore full public confidence in this board and in each one of us. There has been no violation of the Brown Act or of any other law by anyone, and I do want the public record to reflect this fact. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Shocker, and welcome to the first time our first board meeting of the new year. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm looking forward to some things that are coming up. Um, we have an event coming up in the Provo Valley at the Parents Association. We're going to be putting on different classes for parents, teachers, um, anyone who's interested in the community that has children. That is going to be February 23rd, and there's going to be um, information about anti-bullying. There's going to be some information about how to teach your kids about social media. There's information about just, just different things that us as parents and as educators and board members in the community want to stay abreast. Also, I'm super excited that things are moving forward for Pajaro Valley High School, and you will hear more about that to come. And you spoke beautifully about the parent conference, so I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, I'm looking forward to you know, starting it on the committees, especially SELPA, which is in February, and diving into seeing what the new year can bring. So thank you. Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. I've been to a couple of things in the past couple of weeks, and last night, um, meeting, we receive a report on the importance and requirements of having an, a, an, an updated emergency plan for our schools. Our administration will be working with our school size to ensure that those plans are improved and updated. As part of the discussion we had, we also discussed the possibility of notifying parents via text uh, when an emergency does occur. Currently, we only use robocalls, mail, and email notifications, so I would really like to see this through. Um, I also I am also very proud of our winter 2019 map results. Our district is making great progress for every PBUSD student, and we're really proud of that. Um, and for that, I do want to thank our teachers, classified employees, and administration for putting the success of our students at the forefront of everything that you do. And thank you. Hello. I, too, am very excited for this upcoming new year and hope to continue to work with the council to help advance our schools and help our students. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, I celebrated the New Year by first getting the flu and the next day getting married <laughs> while well, I had the flu. So I'm a newlywed, the ripe old age of 51. Um, I had the a distinct call it pleasure, but experience of um, joining with our unions, PF, PBFT and CSEA, who um, generously um, rented buses so that we could go up to the California Department of Education and um, try to prevent uh, a charter school from coming into our district. Unfortunately, um, you've probably seen in the media that the charter school will be joining Watsonville area, Watsonville Charter School, will mean a multi-million dollar loss to our budget here in the district, unfortunately, which our district budgets are pretty tiny, so we're not looking forward to that. But I want to thank, um, we had two busloads of people who um, got up very early in the morning, I think I was the last one on the bus, I didn't feel away from them. Um, and we went up to Sacramento at 6.30 in the morning, and we waited and waited testimony. I spent the first 30 seconds introducing myself and had 30 seconds to speak. So um, anyway, it was a very interesting um, trip. Uh, Trustee Orozco and Trustee Osmondson were both also um, in attendance. And I want to thank everybody who, um, who came and who gave of their day and who were there um, trying to prevent this charter school from entering. The other thing that I've done this week is um, 
I attended um, a PVPSA board meeting. I'm, I'm the new trustee appointed to that um, committee, and I'm happy to report that fiscally PVPSA, which is the Pajaro Valley Prevention um, as, what is the ASA? Assistance. It is a dedicated nonprofit for uh, mental health support for kids and, and families in our district. It's unbelievable. The different. I was on the board there once before, and I haven't been on for a few years. Unbelievable what a new executive director and a lot of money infused into that organization is doing. So um, I'm, I'll be reporting out on that more in the future, and they'll come and give a report too. But we're, I'm very proud to be associated with them and very happy that we've supported um, their efforts. Good evening, everybody. Daniel Dodge, Jr. Um, I've been keeping up with schools in my district. I've, in December, me and Kim, we saw the the migrant ed at Ia Hall. Yes. Um, that was a great performance by Mr. Medina, who's here tonight, for the San Jose State Store. I also um, attended the event at the Mellow Center. Uh, I was a Mr. Orozco, and yesterday uh, I have been visiting Mini Y E Hall, talking to the teachers, talking to the principals, and hearing the concerns. So I, I'm new to this role, and I hope to get a little bit better. So thank you for tolerating. Me. <laughs> okay. So I'm Karen, and I did go to Sacramento. And, you know, here's one of the things I didn't like about the fact that they ruled against this, because we have what is called the local control. That's what we're under now, LCAP, Local Control Accountability Program. So I feel like, in a way, it wasn't fair that we have local control. And so locally, we voted against it, and the County Office of Education voted against it. And so they can take it away from our local control and go up to Sacramento and vote for it. I'm against that. I'm against that. <laughs> so, yes, I also went to the Winter Festival, which was the performances there were just fabulous. It was just such a wonderful thing that they do every year. They've been doing it for a long, long time, I think. I love going to it. And they also feed you afterwards, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, I went to DLAC as well, and Maria told you all about it. I've been going to DLAC for 14 years now. <laughs> and the last thing I could tell you about that I actually went to the Martin Luther King March in Seaside, which was fabulous too. There's a wonderful presentation that they have, and I've got some, a lot of good things to talk to Michelle about their presentation because it was about scholarships for students and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> now we're on the high school students board representatives report. <laughs> and we're looking forward to having Watsonville High School and I think Pajaro Valley High School is here somewhere too. There they are. <laughs> okay, so Watsonville High School, go for it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Diana Chavez. I come to represent Watsonville High School. So on February 7th and February 8th, we will be having pathways for freshmen. There will be pathways for freshmen to take such as career paths, electives, and acad academic paths. We will be, um, we are no longer wall-to-wall -wall academies, and we have added five pathways, which include construction, auto repair, agriculture, band, and choir. We'll also have career day on the same days. 
Uh, we have 50 presenters, but we wish for 10 more. Uh, students will get to choose the sessions, and the, they will get to choose to which presenter they wish to go to. Some of the presenters will include um, Alan Brown, who's a teacher's father who built airplanes for the government, um, a registered nurse, and a police officer. There will also be um, the incoming freshman nights, which there will be two, se two sessions because the, our freshman class is really big and it, it can't, they can't all fit in our mellow center. So on January 31st will be the Spanish session and on February 8th there will be the English speakers. Um, incoming freshmen will come to pick out their classes for the new year. Lastly, we will have the winter, our uh, spirit week and the royal hearts dance. Winters, um, sorry, uh, the spirit week will be from February 12th to the 15th. There will be dress out days and we will be honoring students with community hours and war points. We will also be doing a passport of love, which is a stamp card for students to get a discount off their dance ticket by doing things to be a more kinder and empathetic person. Um, things such as taking a friend or a stranger to lunch and attend a club meeting. And that is all. Thank you. Uh, good evening, fellow board members. Dr. Rodriguez, my name is Daniel Rocha. I hope 2019 is treating the place good. Um, as for our academic school, our academic counselors have been meeting with individual seniors to go over their plans after high school. Um, we've also had numerous powerhouses such as UCLA, Stanford, and Irvine come to our school, and lots of juniors are finding interest in those powerhouses, so it's like the fourth time that UCLA has had to come to PV. Um, for athletics, our girls and boys basketball currently is undefeated. They're both four and one, um, four and zero in the league. And an honorable mention for PV is our ASB president and basketball varsity captain, Jaylene Solorzano. She has definitely earned herself a reputation. Currently, she holds a number one spot in California for points per game. She's averaging about 30 to 35 kills, um, kills and points every game. And she's also ranked top 10 in the nation. And within the top 10, she's in the top five. Um, and for activities, um, our leadership class is currently holding a bug drive. So we're collecting bugs. And basically, the point of the bug drive is we want to go to every elementary school um, specifically their after school program and read to kids and we want to show the kids that there's students out there who actually care about them and with the help of our teachers we have about 250 books already but we're hoping to have more and the first school that we'll be reading to is Calabasas on January 31st. Um, whoops, <laughs> now we're going to have student recognition and the first student is Melanie Edenia Fuentes Gonzalez from Lakeview Middle School. Osmondson, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, um, and fellow community members. My name is Ashley Scally, and I'm a social studies teacher from Lakeview Middle School, and I'm here to speak about why we have chosen Melanie Fuentes Gonzalez as our student of the year. I can attest that Melanie is a great student. She's academically driven and inquisitive, but what is most impressive to me about her is how kind-hearted she is. Melanie's language arts and leadership teacher, Jenny Mumio, right here, wrote that Melanie is an amazing student because she cares so deeply about her community. She works hard as a leadership student and makes the school a more inclusive space for everyone, especially our special education students. Melanie's math teacher, Jose Mesa, who really wanted to be here, but his son had something to be at, um, he wrote that Melanie is a very respectful and caring person. She cares about education, 
and her classmates. Melanie supports her classmates with great patience and gives them all she has. Melanie's seventh grade English language arts teacher, Miss Woods, who's also here, um, noted that Melanie started various clubs at Lakeview, including the Pen Pal Club and the Kindness Club, and has personally reached out to special needs students to make sure they felt included and welcomed. I asked Melanie to explain to me what she enjoyed about school. She said a lot of things, but two of the things that I was really impressed with was that she loves her position in leadership because it has helped her to grow and improve herself as a person and encouraged her to be the best possible version of herself. She enjoys math, no matter how hard it is, because it really makes her think. And when she finally figures something out, it's the best feeling ever. Melanie's goals for the future is, her goal for the future is to attend Harvard Law School and focus on criminal justice and one day become a lawyer. She hopes to create a community where people can understand each other and relate to one another, but still have their own uniqueness. Melanie knows that change starts with her, and she hopes to be part of this change by always working to improve herself every day and never giving up. Melanie, you are truly inspirational and it is an honor to be your teacher. We all believe in you and we're cheering for you. No matter where life takes you, I'm confident that you will help make the world a better place for all of us. Congratulations to all of us from Lakeview. <laughs> now, Melanie has something that she would like to say. Good afternoon, board members and staff. So today I'm here to talk about how thankful I am to have received this award on behalf of Lakeview Middle School. But first, I would like to take a moment and thank you all for organizing such a meaningful event. Tonight, as I stand among many bright people, I am very humble and thankful to have received the 2018-2019 Student of the Year Award. First and foremost, I would like to make it clear that school has not always been easy for me. And I've had my fair shot my fair times where I just don't want to get up and I don't want to put in effort but I always get like comments like oh you're so lucky you're so smart you don't even have to try and the truth is that's not true I've wanted to stop doing homework and hang out with friends or use my phone but I wanted success way more so I put in a tremendous amount of energy I didn't know I had just to stand out by a little I would have never thought that I was capable of achieving something so honoring, but none of this was possible without my amazing principal, Rosa Hernandez. Thank you so much for being so open-minded and for being such an amazing role model. And next, I would want to thank Ms. Lemieux. <laughs> I've known Ms. Lemieux for about a year now, and since the moment I met her, I knew she was always going to be there for me, and that was why I met her same way. I also want to thank my math teacher, Ms. Demessa for teaching me so many life lessons and for inspiring me to push myself. I am so truly thankful. Next is someone who has a very big place in my heart, and that's Miss Scally. I wish there was enough words to describe how amazing she is. She went above and beyond just to make sure I fit into a great high school. Miss Scally deserves way more than what all Lakeview students can provide. <laughs> Overall, I want to thank everyone, good and bad, for teaching me lessons to better improve myself for who I am as a person. And thank you to all my past and present teachers for absolutely everything. Last but not least, I want to thank my parents for doing the absolute most for me, always understanding me and supporting me. Thank you again, and I cannot truly say it enough. I will continue to strive and carry on all the wonderful advice I'm receiving. Even when I think it is not possible, it is always possible. <laughs> and I want to personally remind you that education is a lifelong journey as long as you choose to not stop learning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
And the next is Chase Jockis. Hopefully I'm saying it right. Mains. Mains. At Prescott. Junior high. Good evening, uh, President Osmondson, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, um, member of the cabinet. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Rich Moran. I'm principal at Aptos Junior High School, and it's a privilege and honor to be here with uh, Mr. Chase Jacquemain and his family. Um, and it's my honor to, to speak about Chase, and I'll do it as concisely as I can. Believe me, there's a lot to say, but I think I got the good parts. <laughs> uh, Chase Jacquemain is an intelligent, methodic, driven, caring individual. All day, every day. Chase is a straightforward young man, linear thinker, and one that takes action. Quite simply, he's driven. His current GPA of 3.979, an Aptos Junior High School two-mile cross-country record of 11 minutes, 30 seconds, is a testament to both his commitment and desire to excel. Wow. Neither of those things come easy. Um, you can talk to the students chasing him. They'll let you know. <laughs> this year, as part of the Aptos Junior High School leadership class, Chase and a classmate decided to run the Aptos Junior High School. Um, it was a bike to school day event, a typical event. Um, that quickly turned into a bike to school week. Um, bike to school week included bike safety lessons, videos, trivia questions, raffles, and culminated with a bike to school morning breakfast. Execution of this week-long event required the development of scripts, trivia questions for morning announcements, which they delivered in my office, um, the securing of facilities for lunchtime, bike and safety classes, presentations, raffles, gifts, as well as numerous hours of planning with partners and Aptos Junior High School staff. Because of their creativity, motivation, and drive, um, Aptos Junior High School Bike to School Day quickly became uh, a successful Bike to School Week. Wow. Most importantly, it's Chase's day-to-day -day activities that set, set him apart. Um, he's done a lot of great things at Aptos Junior, but when you ask Chase instructors, um, they describe him as someone that helps everyone with anything all the time. Um, he does not wait to be asked or helped. He looks for those that are struggling, and he steps in. He's a leader in class, the type that leads quietly, requiring no attention or recognition, but you'll see him working when you walk into a classroom. He'll often be working on what he needs to do and spending a lot of time supporting those around him because that's who he is. Chase shows compassion and empathy on a daily basis. True to character, Chase credits his father's drive and commitment to athletics and his mother's thirst for information and education as contributing factors to his character. It is for these reasons the staff of Aptos Junior High School would like to congratulate Chase Jockman. We're proud to have him represent Aptos Junior High School as our student of the year. And most importantly, um, he's a bright young man. Um, he's definitely driven. But the empathy and compassion and caring that he demonstrates regularly and the fact that it was noticed by so many staff members clearly set him apart. So we're proud to have Chase up here today. We're proud to have his family with us. And again, I'd like to congratulate him on behalf of the staff and faculty at Aptos Junior High School. And we saw that the, the mold was broken, so Chase has a brief word to say. Thank you, Mr. Moran. And uh, I just want to keep this short, but uh, thank you to my parents and my whole family for being here, as well as uh, my math teacher, Mr. Sims, and my principal, Mr. Moran, for showing up to support me um, of course, all my teachers really were helpful and encouraging and positive in every way. And I just, um, I'm really grateful and happy to be here. Uh, it's really a, a culmination of um, my career, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. How are you related to that lady over there? That's your grandma. Hi, Linda. I know your grandma. I know your uncle. I work in health. And my name's Kim. I'm the trustee here. And this is Jennifer at home. And we represent the Aptos area for we're elected to make sure that we always the best. And you are the best example of all the kids at your school. 
because of everything that you've accomplished. We could not be more proud of everything that you, you're doing, and we're so excited to hear about you in the future. So keep up the good work, and congratulations, honey. Congratulations to your whole family. Grandma, you have to be in the picture. <laughs> wow, we should have named them all. Anybody else want to take a picture? <laughs> so, yeah. so now I'm calling up Andrew Alvarado, Rolling Hills Middle School. Everybody should come up, like they should have all come up too. <laughs> Good evening, President Osmundson, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. My name is Nicholas Bugion. I teach eighth grade math, and I will be speaking on behalf of the Rolling Hills staff. Um, it is my honor to present to you Rolling Hills Student of the Year, Andrew Alvarado. I have known Andrew for the past three years, mostly from his involvement in school sports, and most recently, as a student in my math class. All Andrew's teachers describe him as a strong leader in, the, in their classrooms. I have also experienced his leadership qualities firsthand as his coach. Andrew not only plays every sport at Rolling Hills, but is almost always a captain on all the teams he is on. Wow. Andrew is well liked by all his peers. He is always going out of his way to include everyone. An example of this, was when he volunteered to host two foreign exchange students from Japan, letting them shadow, shadow him around in all his classes and showing them our school and the surrounding area. Andrew's strong leadership is evident, is evident everywhere he goes, on the field, in the hallways, and in the classroom. Andrew excels in his academics, getting A's and B's in all his classes. His current teachers praise Andrew for his work ethic, compassion, and teamwork in the classroom. He is also a graduate of the Bruce W. Wolper Algebra Academy, which is a program for students with a high aptitude in math. He remains involved in school through extracurricular activities like Math Club, and he recently visited Stanford University through a program called Splash, where he was able to take classes on electromagnetism, robotics, and chemistry. Andrew is hoping to continue doing sports in high school and is planning to go to college to study computer science. We are all excited to watch this young man's bright future as he continues to learn and grow throughout high school and college. It has been my pleasure to present to you Rolling Hills Student of the Year, Andrew Alvarado. Thank you for your time. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you to um, my math teacher, Mr. Bugion. Uh We have a game tomorrow, flag football. Hope you win tomorrow. Um, thank you to my principal, Mr. Ito, and vice principal, Mr. Fry. Thank you to um, all my family for supporting me. And um, yeah, thank you.
And now Diego Munoz, Minty White. Good evening, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board. Um, we have here tonight his fifth grade teacher, Ms. Kirkman, um, his mom and his dad, his sister, who is a former student of the year, and his younger brother, who we expect to be a future. A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on you, <laughs> but you've got a few more years. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Diego Munoz, our student of the year, a great and mighty eagle indeed. Uh, what I really appreci we appreciate about Diego is his problem-solving attitude as well as his drive for learning. While Diego has all the qualities of a great student, just as important to him are his friendships with others. He's caring, he's helpful, he's loyal, and he's very funny. As a student, he's prepared, he's inquisitive, hardworking, and insightful. He is a student that we can always count on to bring, our to bring this Kirkman's class to a deeper discussion. Diego has all the qualities of a phenomenal writer. His voice, his vocabulary, and imagination are carefully crafted in every story he writes. As a Minty White Eagle exemplifies the three principles of our school, respect, responsibility, and safety. He was also elected as a member of student council and works to provide ideas and solutions for improving our campus. I know that Diego is both pushed and supported by his family, thus two student of the year so far. Um, and they are driving force in his success. They value his education. Diego plans to attend Cabrillo College to further his education and help him to achieve his goal of becoming a published author. And we want the first copy of the book. He's already producing comic story, comic books and writing works of writing that he shared with the class. I cannot wait to see his published works. We are very proud to be able to present to you tonight our student of the year, Diego Munoz. Go ahead, he can clap my <laughs> And because it's such an honor for him, we want his parents to be able to understand all the wonderful things we had, have to say about him. So Ms. Kirkman is going to read the same thing in Spanish for him. Disculpa mi español. Me gustaría presentarles a Diego Muñoz, nuestro alumno, alumno del año. Lo que realmente aprecio de Diego es su actitud para resolver problemas, así como su motivación para aprender. Mientras que Diego tiene todas las cualidades de un gran estudiante, tan importante para él son sus amistades con las demás. Es cariñoso, servicial, leal y divertido. Como estudiante está preparado, es inquisitivo, trabajador y perspicaz. Él es un estudiante con el que siempre puedo contar para profundizar nuestra discusión en clase. Diego tiene todas las cualidades de un escritor fenomenal. Su voz, vocabulario y imaginación están cuidadosamente elaborados en cada historia. Como un águila de Minty White, ejemplifica los tres principios de nuestra escuela. Respeto, responsabilidad y seguridad. Fue elegido como representante del Consejo Estudiantil y trabaja para proporcionar ideas y soluciones para mejorar nuestra escuela. Yo sé que Diego es motivado y apoyado por su familia para alcanzar su potencial más alto y son una fuerza impulsora en sus éxitos. Diego planea asistir a Cabrillo College para continuar su educación y ayudarlo a lograr su ob objetivo de convertirse en un autor publicado. Ya está produciendo cómics y obras de escritura que comparte con la clase. No puedo esperar a ver sus obras publicadas. Me sentí muy orgulloso para poder nominarlo nuestro estudiante del año y saber que hay grandes cosas para él. I am very honored and flattered 
<laughs> for this award. And I have to thank everyone, my teacher, the, my principal, and of course, my family. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you on behalf of Mr. DCA, our academic coordinator, myself, and all the great and mighty eagles of Minty White. Thank you. <laughs> Don't think I'm, I'm Danny. I'm the representative in our area. And my daughter used to go to school with me when we were really young. Um, on behalf of me, the Board of Trustees, um, the, whole, the whole district, everybody in your community, our community, I wanted to give you your student recognition um, on behalf of Mini White School, and to follow your dreams even if no one else believes in you. She has another one. She has a lot. Of, she has a lot. <laughs> We've got to probably move on. So I'm going to ask for an approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? I'll move to Oh, I approve. was going to, and I'm going to do one thing about the agenda. <laughs> I'll go ahead if you want me. Um, I was just making a motion to approve the agenda, Pre President Osmondson. Okay, and, and then we can have a second. And move. yeah, I can I finish? Okay, okay. I will move to approve the agenda, and I would like to remind you to be mindful of the time limits set for each agenda item. Um, and with that, maybe I am asking uh, for you uh, to amend your motion. I do want to request item 8.1 to go after item 5.1 we do have a student presentation and they need to go home um so if that's okay with you wait move 8.1 to after 5.1 correct i'm fine with that absolutely thank you so first okay and second. all those in all those in favor aye aye, aye. aye. okay seven zero um now the appro approval of the minutes um, we're going to approve the December 12th organizational board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion pending that there's. I'll make a motion pending there's a correction made for section 2.3 to read an alleged Brown Act violation. I'll second that. Okay. Okay, so I have a second, right? Okay, can I have a can I have a did, vote? Do you clearly get that? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So we're going to now have the positive report from Colobos's green team. And we're gonna ask Laura R now. Am I saying that correctly? <laughs> did, did I say it correctly? Are now? Good. <laughs> Come up with your students. Okay. Sorry, I'm pretty short. Hi, good evening, members of the board. We're very grateful for the opportunity to present to you some news from Calabasas' green team. I'd like to introduce Diana Arguello and Sam Waite, who are going to be doing the presentation. Today we have some interesting news from our green team. Hi, I'm Diana. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. I just want to say that we are the green team and what we do. Um, so, oh, sorry. 
So one thing we do is we work with PBUSD to replace sports packets with a dis dispenser. We gave everyone a reusable water bottle using our Ocean, Guardi Ocean <laughs> Guardians grant. Last year, we did a research on why kids snuck out Chinese wrappers. This year, we are researching the effects on plastic on the ocean and soil. We are going to Agalita Young's Pop Summit for the first time, as well as the Monterey Bay Aquarium Plastic Pollution Summit for the fourth time. We made a warm bin for composting scraps from our cafeteria and food snacks. Um, one of our projects that we've been working on for a while was um, a water billing, bottle filling station. So we used a grant to purchase the water bottle filling station. We've been waiting for a while, and we just found out that we will be um, getting the water bottle state. Not one, but two water bottle filling stations in to our school. and. Um, the water bottle filling stations are so that we aren't constantly using single-use water bottles um, to, that we have to throw away after we're done just to keep people hydrated. And we think that every school should have one so um, that there's not as many people throwing those away. So we want to get rid of shiny snack wrappers in our district. So one thing why we want to get rid of them is they end up in our campus and they never get picked up. They are really light and, and blow into our ocean. We, are, we aren't sure if they sink or float. They, they might end up in our soil. Animals can confuse, them, the wrap, can confuse the wrappers with food and might just eat it. We want PBUSD to choose a better wrapper or serve snacks in bulk. Recently, the um, Green Team found an article by Stanford University about a toxin that most people know as BPA that can leak out of certain types of plastic that are most commonly used to wrap the um, lunches and the cafeterias. And so when the plastic is heated up, the toxin can leak out and the out of the wrapper into, and into the food. And this toxin has been um, linked by Stanford with multiple can types of cancers. And these wrappers are still ending up in the trash. And we think one possible solution is to um, serve the food in a reusable dish without um, heating them up inside of the plastic. say thank you to you guys for um we want to say thank you for your support and helping us everything you have done for our school we also want to thank thank to the ocean guardian ocean guardian for making all of our goals possible Thank you so much. You were great. <laughs> you're doing such good work. We really need the kind of work you're doing. Okay, I'm going to um, do... I just wanted to... You didn't ask if there was any comments. It's comment, board comment okay. time. Okay. Um, no, I just wanted to chime in my comment um, when uh, President Trustee Osmondson and I were up at the CSBA conference. We actually attended one of the seminars on the sustainability within school districts within the state of California. And I'm very excited to see that you guys are getting the water station. I hope you're getting stainless steel water bottles provided by the school district to match that, at least one per student and staff member, hopefully. <laughs> I, I, I certainly will support that. So whatever you need um, with direction from me, I will support that. I'm, I believe trust, uh, President Trustee Osmondson will as well. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on what and you're we doing. To, We're glad to see it happen. We need to not use these either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think we made a request that these get eliminated, actually, didn't uh -huh. we? Yeah.
That's a shame. I'd like to see it be stainless steel better for them and for your staff. Question, have you already bought those water bottles with your grant? You have? Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can ask our superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez, if it's possible that the district grant writer would she be able to help support them in finding if there's any other funding that they could get to get stainless steel bottles instead of plastic reusables? Sure. So, um, of course, when we we do something that's a cost, um, we always look at equity across multiple schools. So I will say that we can bring back the item um, and talk about the cost um, because although... I love calabazas, and um, I, we we need to be equitable in the distribution because we have several schools that have um, hydration stations, so it's not just calabazas. Um, so we can bring back, um, of course, our grant writer does support efforts, um, but even at the district level, she just provides the coordination and not the writing. Um, but we can um, try to be of support. We do um, have an update for the board. So we do have um, water bottles, which we are going to be receiving for you. I will now check if they're stainless steel because I don't think they were because um, we were trying to ensure um, reduction of costs. Um, but we will, um, we will look into, we know that we need to get rid of um, these water bottles and um, so you can contact Andrea Willey and, um, and she can help move that forward. And then um, we can discuss putting the item on the board um, once we find out cost. Uh, Superintendent Rodriguez, I would, I totally agree with you about the equitable across all of the schools in the, in the district. Um, so do you have any information on us for us where we would be at with water stations at all of the schools throughout the, the school district? I mean, do you know what that number is of how many have them? And so, how many don't? Obviously. Right. So very few have them. Most of them that do have them have been supported by either grants or they have been supported by parent organizations. So, for example, um, Aptos High has them. Um, and we are actually in the middle of doing um, some additional ones. I can get a listing for you of all the locations that they're at. And whatever we could do to help support that to become a more equitable across sure. that. Totally. Thank you. Item. Do we have any public comments? We have Mr. Beecher. Bill Beecher. Thank you, Madam President, Superintendent Rodriguez, uh, trustees. <clears throat> At the closed session, I talked about a Brown Act violation. Um, it depends on who you talk to on whether there was a violation or not. Uh, the registered Pararonian tried to interview all five people. Only three responded. Now, I'm old fashioned, and maybe that's half right. That's a joke. I was taught you lead by example. Leading by example means you avoid situations that might look strange different. And when you're involved with children, it's important to lead by example because who are they learning from? Their teachers and us, the board, and people like myself. You don't get yourself into situations that look questionable. That meeting should not have been held. Uh, two, of the, two of the people were seasoned trustees and had been trained. They should have known better. I uh, I have filed last week a Brown Act violation with the district attorney because bringing it to the board makes no sense because five of the seven trustees were involved. No action can be done. Also, the board is limited to what they can do. A wrist slap. You can't make people step down. They can only be recalled, and this board can't do that. So I'm willing to pull back that filing with the district attorney if one individual would step down from the board, because I think uh, trustee, uh, 
Acosta was responsible for pulling that meeting together and should have known better. Now, whether there was a violation or not, I don't care. I'm old fashioned. You lead by example. You don't do stuff like that. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have the employee organizations, PVFT. Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez um, with Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. I uh, just want to um, you know, acknowledge those board members that attended uh, to Sacramento uh, to try and keep uh, Navigator schools from coming into our district. Um, you, you probably are all familiar with the uh, strike in uh, LA um, last week and a little uh, part of the settlement talked about um, uh, charter schools and I have a copy here of the actual resolution that will be presented to the LAUSD uh, Board of Trustees for their consideration. I think that it would be a very good um, idea for you as a board uh, to stand behind that resolution, basically uh, urging the governor, the superintendent of public instruction, and the uh, state board of education uh, to conduct a study to look at um, the chartering of uh, or reforming the chartering process, uh, including um, what Trustee uh, De Serpa mentioned uh, that the control should be uh, locally and not by, I'm sorry, Trustee Osmondson mentioned um, that the control should be local and not uh, by, by the uh, State Board of Education that does not even have enough personnel to oversee the charters that they um, uh, do uh, approve. Um, and we'll make these available, and I hope that um, this resolution uh, or a version of it uh, is approved uh, unanimously uh, by you all to uh, show your support. Um, the other um, item that I wanted to point out is uh, an MOU uh, for uh, looking at ending the uh, provision of services from the county for, with regards to uh, career technical education. Um, I think that that is a, a good move. We have been assured that uh, there will be a savings within uh, with the move, and so uh, we're looking forward uh, to you approving that and uh, working uh, with you to uh, ensure that um, those teachers that will become new employees um, are, are given uh, a fair uh, contract and a fair uh, representation uh, as they become uh, members of the PVUSD family. Thank you. Nine point one. So good evening. Um, uh, pleased to provide our annual district audit. Uh, the district is required to uh, provide a third party uh, independent uh, audit and review of our um, district budget and uh, for the past fiscal year. Um, making sure that we have a state certified auditor who examines the records of the district and the procedures and processes uh, and within our fiscal transactions and maintaining our financial records. Uh, so one, making sure that we provide, uh, we have the financial uh, components in place, but also transparency 
and that we're following all the uh, regulations and laws accordingly. Uh, the audit for 2017-18 uh, fiscal year was performed by Veteran uh, Trine Day and Company. And uh, we have Ahmad here this evening joining us to present the uh, audit. Um, and so by every year, January 31st, we have to provide our um, annual audit to the board. Uh, and so I'm pleased, uh, and uh, I know Ahmad, I'm taking your thunder here, but I'm pleased to announce that we have no financial um, or audit findings. And that's a huge success on uh, internally to our team and to our various directors, our department heads throughout our departments, throughout the district, our superintendent and cabinet, uh, it speaks volumes. Um, one of the items that I've seen in other districts through experience as well is our um, uh, the high school level where ASB is always a common finding. And for our district at PVUSD, there are no findings. Um, and I'd like to thank our staff for the dedicated uh, professional development and the training that we've uh, put out throughout our sites. Uh, and with that being said, I'd like to bring Ahmad up to the, the podium to give an overview of the audit. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, um, we are the independent auditors for uh, the district. Uh, the scope of the audit is to ensure that the financial statements are fairly stated. Um, it is a process that starts at the beginning of the year and ends all the way through uh, October or November timeframe, typically. Um, you are a local government. Uh, you are required by the education code to undergo a financial audit. And because you receive federal and state funding, you are required to undergo uh, an audit for federal compliance and state compliance. So we begin the process at the beginning of the year in which we go out to the sites. Uh, we test student bodies, uh, various processes over there. We take a look at the attendance. Uh, then we come back uh, during the middle of the year in which we test uh, uh, internal controls, the manner that you process receipts, the manner that you process payroll, the manner that you uh, process disbursements. And then we come back at, at, uh, after the district closes the books. It is a process in which we confirm the balances. We confirm your state revenues, uh, your LCFF. You, we confirm uh, your uh, investment balances, cash in county, treasury. The various numbers are, are reported on the financial statements. Um, and then we issue opinions on the financial statements. Alongside with that, we actually do test uh, compliance with the ballot language with respect to Measure L uh, for the bond funds. Um, I'm pleased to let you know that uh, we issued clean opinions on the district's uh, compliance, federal, state, uh, Measure L, and the financial statements also received a clean opinion, meaning that they are fairly stated in all material respect. Um, yeah, we come in after the fact. The work is pretty much done by management. They are the ones that close the books and ensure that the numbers are accurate. Um, we just come in at the end of the day to confirm these balances and look at the processes that they uh, uh, undertook to come up with these numbers, and including the internal controls. So we thank district's management for assisting us with the uh, completion of the audit. And uh, with that, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. I, I do have a comment, but I'm related. Um, before you uh, call a motion, I think the process to follow is to first call speakers and then make a motion. Is that correct? So can we do it both? No, you're supposed to call the motion first and then the speakers. Okay, thank you. I stand corrected. I guess I'll ask something. Um, so I saw in there all about the, the gasp I think that's called what it's called, gasp. Gatsby. And it and it goes all the way from seventy five to ninety. There's all these different ones, gasp, 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 gasp. And I was just wondering, so are do they 
come up with those every year or they've been around forever, all those gaps or how does that occur? Yeah, so actually the uh, in accounting industry with respect to governmental accounting has actually changed quite drastically uh, over the past, I wanna say three or four years. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. When I first started, we were up to GASB 27 and within the last five years, they issued about, I want to say, a third of the 90 GASBs that you see out there. Um, it is a board that is uh, 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 appointed <coughs> excuse me, with uh, regulating the accounting industry. One of the significant changes uh, to, uh, that impact the districts is the pension and OPEP standards, in which you have to estimate these liabilities and report them on the financial statements. Um, and they had a significant impact on the financial statements over the last two or three years in common with other local governments in there. Um, they issue these gas bees pretty much every year now. Um, some of them are significant uh, as they relate to the financial statements. Uh, some of them are not, but they just make the financial statements more transparent to the reader of the financial statements. And so you, you will see one or two coming out every single year. Let's say I did notice in there that, and you know I think we've been sort of told that, but our ADA has decreased by 141, it said, and that it's supposed to be increasing by 52. That's what it said in there. <laughs> right. So uh, you probably were looking at the trends. Uh, so these are fluxes. In some years, it, it'll decrease. And in some years, it is an increase. So probably that's what, what you were looking at. Um, yeah, I think I saw that in the whole, it was numbers. a lot to read, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, so just for the public's sake, because this was a, a, a very meaty report to read and dry for those of us who aren't um, in accounting, um, were there any findings that you want to talk to the board or to the public about that we need to keep an eye on? Uh, we have no findings. Um, we like to see segregations of functions and duties uh, with respect to district assets and the, the individuals that maintain the record. Uh, all of these passed. Now, we sample. Uh, we don't test everything. Um, uh, in the upcoming years, we will change that sample to incorporate the element of unpredictability um, and uh, select various types of processes that the district takes uh, to process receipts, disbursements, payroll, or reporting, or attendance, or whatever that is out there uh, that within the scope of the audit. Um, this year, we had no findings. So all of the items that we tested did not have any we did not know any deficiencies in the internal controls. That's great. Did we, I'll ask this to Helen, did we switch, we switched to a new system recently, correct? We are switching to a new system. Okay, so we're still, we were auditing on the last system. Okay, great. We're currently on the old system. July 1, we're transitioning to the new system. And do we expect the new system to be more efficient, easier? Yes. All the above. I've talked yeah. to several people throughout the state yeah. um, that have worked on the new system and they are very happy to turn to that. Okay. Well, I know I know preparing for an audit. I've worked in, you know, multiple organizations where we prepared for audit and I know it's a tremendous amount of work. So, I want to thank you and all of your colleagues for getting it ready. I'm sure it was a lot of late nights. And thank thank you to the auditors for the thorough job and um, happy with the report of no findings. Thank you. Almost three hours to read. <laughs> Second to the motion. So I keep I have to keep turning it on all the time now. <laughs> okay, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, okay, so seven zero. Six six. Oh, zero, one. oh six zero one. She's not here. With Georgia, I'm sorry. Okay, six zero one. I didn't see that. Six zero one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you. Now we're doing 9.2 school accountability report cards and the report will be presented by Susan Perez. Um, actually, I would like to introduce um, Francis Whitney, um, our coordinator of research accountability and assessment who oversees program evaluation and she will be um, providing this report this evening. Great, thank you. <laughs> And you're just, you, you, can you make it higher? Can this board up higher? We'll just hold it here. <laughs> I think it. I think it moves up and down the podium. I think so. It does. I'll just hold it. It's easier. Yeah, it's fine. Um, uh, thank you for your time this evening. Um, I'm here to uh, review with you our annual SARC uh, presentation. Uh, this is a state required uh, function that my office um, handles. Uh, the SARC report is a report card for each site that we maintain here at the district. It is state required. Um, tonight, uh, we're presenting the SARCs in total to you for approval. Once uh, the board approves, that triggers our ability to post them to the state, as well as to post them locally on our websites, which we are required to do by February 1. Um, the SARC reports, for those of you that are new, um, the SARCs are typically showing data that is a year in arrears. So in other words, we're looking at old data. Um, parts of the report do reflect current data, but the bulk of the report is reflecting things from the past school year, just so that there's clarity on that. Um, there are two examples that are in your packet for um, you to review. One example is from the elementary um, side of the house, and the other is from secondary. There are minor differences with secondary. Secondary does report a little bit more uh, regarding um, uh, high school. So um, you will see those examples. Mar Vista was included for elementary and Pajaro Valley High for high school. Um, the components of the report were listed in the enclosure, so there are those specified um, pieces that are required. Um, every site uh, principal is um, required to review each year to make sure that all of that information is current and accurate. Um, we start this process in September. We send the reports for translation by December so that we can then bring them forward to you um, here in January so that we can get them approved and posted as needed by February 1. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> we'll have time for questions too. Okay, so can I have a motion? <laughs> motion. Okay, any public speakers? No? Okay, any discussion from the board? I mean, are you going to present them more to us? Oh, okay. We're not presenting. The, the, we're not showing them up in there. No, each report is anywhere from eleven to thirteen pages. So we simply provided the two in your packet as an example. Yeah, we did get those. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Okay, Jen. Um, yeah. So I was really pleased to see you know in their in their reports that. You know, items for you know, facilities that were anything less than good, had a plan. You said we're working from old data. Are, do we know the status of some of those repairs? Or? Oh, um, so in the, um, in the report it says, you know, I, for any items, that, repair items that were less than good, there, were, there, there was a note that there was plans in place for uh, fixing those. How, where are we at with those? Are you speaking specifically to a particular site or just in general? Um, is, they is, both had them. They could both I had follow not good. up to find out where, like for in Mar Vista, you know, for there was interior surfaces and things like that? Yeah, so we, um, for, for each of, when we do the Williams visit, mm -hmm. part of it is the facilities visit. And so off of that visit, then we make plans for any modifications that need to happen. So off of anything that was cited on the sites, then we put it into the work order system. 
so I can specifically give you um, information in the update on um, on any particular site that you want. All right, thank you. Any other comments from the board? No. Okay. Okay. So you said that um, we could find each school SARC on their website, and are they currently loaded up and clearly marked? Last year's versions are. Um, as soon as we have approval tonight, tomorrow, that, that triggers the activation of loading the web pages. I do have the page ready to go, waiting to be published. Right. And then we forward copies uh, to the state as well so that they're also posted at the state level. And then in my office, I'm required to actually provide paper copy for anyone who asks. Right. And I know all of this data is based on last year, and we like, we're, we're looking at like data from the last six months, like, you know, coming out that shows that we're making good progress. But was there anything to be learned from any of these, this information that you, you can tell us? In general, um, the pieces that are current actually are the, the pieces in the report that deal with the professional development that the sites are going through, that the sites have determined is most um, valuable to promoting uh, student achievement. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's some exciting things going on. Again, I'm reading all of these reports, and, and there's been quite a bit of work at the site level to um, really expand the options that are available to teachers, and that was, um, it's a nice trend to see. Uh, with regard to some of the budget um, items, I know that um, Helen's department provides a lot of the cost breakdown. There hasn't been any change to that over the years. It's just the steady <coughs> increase in costs and so forth, and then the disbursement of that per pupil. Um, our, um, our achievement, uh, data from the state is also provided. All of that is, is as you say, the current information. Um, and so it's a, it's a interesting, it's an interesting mix of old data with current data in the SARC. And again, it is a requirement by the state. Many of our other um, reporting measures are much more current that we are using on a, a more daily basis. The SARC is simply a requirement that we must fulfill. Another question I have is under the um, academic counselors and other support staff. It says counselor point two zero. Is that kids corner? Or is that an actual credentialed counselor at the Mar Vista school site? All of them are kids corner. Okay, kids corner. Okay. And then we do have our social emotional counselors that are at the site. Um, I don't know what you're it's referring to, elementary. but at the elementary, there's one social emotional counselor for every four elementary schools. Oh, okay, schools. so that is the credential counselor. Yeah. Okay, but then nowhere here does it, um, the kids' corner is not included then in, in these numbers. Yeah, so this only occurs, this only includes our own staff. Our own staff, okay. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the average teacher salary at Mar Vista is $69,000, which I thought was great. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I have a second to the motion? Second. Second. I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, it is 7-0 now. Thank you. Okay, this is a really good one here. <laughs> I'm going to approve resolution support of Black History Month, and report will be presented by Miss Lisa Aguirre. <laughs> Good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I am pleased um, to have in front of you a resolution acknowledging Black History Month in Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm going to go through and read a little bit of the resolution. Um, the resolution states that whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes that Black History Month is the opportunity to promote and foster cultural relevance in our schools and enrich the educational experiences of our students to deepen the understanding of the different perspectives of American history. Whereas PVUSD recognizes the significant contributions and considerable advances that African Americans have made and continue to make in our community, state, and the world in such areas as education, medicine, technology, art, culture, public service, economics, and development, politics, and human rights, 
We see the greatness in a, of America and those who have risen above injustice and enriched our society. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District encourages all PVUSD educators to celebrate, honor, and study the contributions of African Americans throughout the year and to include the lived experiences each and every month and not just in the upcoming month. Therefore, be it resolved that Pajaro Valley Unified, uh, Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees acknowledges February 2019 as Black History Month and recognizes the significance of Black History Month as an important time to acknowledge and celebrate the contributions of African Americans in our nation's history. Therefore, be resolved that the Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees encourages the continued celebration of this month to provide an opportunity for all members of the district to learn more about the past and better understand the experiences that have shaped the nation and the world. Passed it and adopted this 23rd day of January mm -hmm. um, by the following. <laughs> All right, can I have a motion? I'd like to move. <laughs> Any public speakers? No? Okay, discussion from the board about it. <laughs> this is great and timely because of Martin Luther King Day. And thank you for presenting it. And I also am very proud that our new Congress has many, 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 I'm not sure how many um, African American, mostly women, I would say, that are in our Congress now that I'm, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I'd like to second the motion. Okay, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Seven zero. Thank you very much. I'm going to do approve another resolution, and that is acknowledging it's not a whole month, but it, I'm acknowledging National School Counseling Week, and report will be given by Shona Keelan. Am I saying that right? Keelan. Mr. Rodriguez is going to do this with me because they are also part of his bargaining team. So um, nationals, uh, thank you, uh, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. National School Counseling Week will be celebrated on February 4th through 8, 2019 to focus public attention on the valuable work and important contributions of our school counselors in our system. It is our pr pleasure to present a resolution honoring our counselors. Whereas our school counselors are employed in public and private schools to help students reach their full potential, explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these traits relate to career awareness and development, help parents focus on ways to further the growth of their children, work with teachers and other educators to help students explore their potential and set realistic goals for themselves, identify and utilize community resources to help students, help children become members of teams that nurture their individual strengths ac across both personal and academic endeavors, De deliver a continuum of academic support that lower barriers to learning. Here again, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District reiterates and recognizes the vital role that school counselors play in the personal and academic development of our children, whereas comprehensive developmental school counseling programs are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success in school. Therefore, on behalf of the Board of Trustees <laughs> um, of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, do hereby proclaim February 4th through 8th, 2019 as National okay. School Counseling Week. And okay. Like you passed this. <laughs> Can I have a motion? Motion. Okay. Any public speaking? Oh, you do have a public speaker. There you go. Yes, thank you. Francisco. Yeah, the won't pinch me now. <laughs> um, so, so um, you know, thank you for uh, recognizing the work that our counselors do. It's uh, very important work. Um, my, my comments just wanted to uh, mention to you just a couple of things. Uh, to, uh, last week, uh, for the first time, uh, our counselors um, were able to get organized and formally elect a representative to our representative council. Oh. Uh, so now um, the counseling department in PVUSD is gonna have their own representatives um, as at, at our representative council. 
Um, I think this is a really good step in uh, uh, for us because this will allow the uh, counselors to bring up uh, issues to us uh, with regards to, for example, uh, their caseload size or, for example, the fact that um, there's three different types of counselors uh, in our school, at least um, one are the high school counselors that have their own issues and circumstances. Then we have middle school counselors and, of course, the social-emotional counselors. And they all have uh, very unique issues and needs that uh, we're hoping that uh, they can give us the feedback and participate with us uh, in advocating for their working uh, conditions and uh, facilitate the work that they provide for students. So um, thank you, and we look forward to working with you on that. Discussion by the board? No. Well, yes. do, do, okay. sorry. Go ahead. Do we have any counselors here today? Are there any counselors with us to meet out here? In the, out in on the, the public. public? In the public. Uh, I just had a couple questions I'm, I wanted to ask them. But um, I, I could just ask when I ask Shona. Um, I, I wanted to ask, what does an, a normal case load look like for academic counselors? For example, lots of a high or... Um, another one I come up with is like, what does a, a normal case though look like for a behavioral, or emotional, especially like at a meeting way? So our social emotional counselors, there it's for every four schools we have mm -hmm. a counselor. At, 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 yeah, at, at, at Mint, especially at um, Minty White. Um, what tends to happen though, they're not where they're um, fixed each day at a school site. So mm -hmm. if something comes up, mm -hmm. the counselor works closely with Suzanne Smith, our director mm -hmm. of student services, to make sure that the student's needs mm -hmm. um, are met. Is there any way we can add maybe a little bit more time or another technician? Uh, I've been walking around Mini White, E Hall, Radcliffe, and the number one thing I've been hearing is um, they are seeing a lot of traumatic experiences in kids and they think maybe a little bit more time or someone else would really help out. So I'm wondering if there's anything we could do about that. So I know that that's been a board discussion for a while. Um, it was brought up previously when we talked about LCAP and reducing. Um, so that's something that we can definitely bring back as a board discussion so that we can look at costs and look at how we can reduce, um, reduce down um, ratios. So again, when we're thinking, it, we have to look globally um, so we can talk about fiscal impact. And I know um, it is true that we're seeing nationally that there's more, that students are experiencing more trauma. I think also, frankly, adults are experiencing more trauma as well, which is um, bleeding down or transferring um, to students as well. Um, but we can um, put together um, some numbers and, and bring it back for discussion for sure. All right. Thank you. Okay, so can I have a second? And I'm going to have a motion. Everybody, you know, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> all those opposed? She didn't look like she was going to. Okay. Um, it's seven zero. <laughs> okay. Um, now we're going to do a middle school ELD instructional materials pilot and adoption, and it's going to be presented by Michael Berman. <laughs> Hi, Michael Berman. <laughs> Hi. Good evening, President Osmondson, <laughs> Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, about a year ago, we began the process of looking into um, ELD instructional materials at middle school. <clears throat> Before I get into the details of the process, kind of want to lay some of, the, some of the purpose, some of the why. Um, our total enrollment at the end of last year was over 20,000 students. Uh, 13,000 of them, over 13,000 of them are ELs. 
yet to reclassify, we have 8,500. And our LTELs, our long-term English learners, or at risk of becoming LTELs, uh, make up 14.7% of our, our current district, wow. um, almost 3,000 students, wow. um, which is a large percentage. And um, this is based on California data. What, what they found is that students who have yet to reclassify um, do significantly worse on state assessments. Um, as you can see, the orange represents our English learners, and the um, green and blue represent our FEPs and EL, I mean EOs. So in the process of adopting, uh, we started last spring having a publisher's fair, and we selected two curriculums. Um, in August through November, we, we piloted both curriculums to six-week sessions. December 5th, we had our, um, we had our day to make a decision. And, um, and then today, we're presenting our um, recommendation to the board. The two curriculums that we were looking at and piloted were Pearson Islet and Houghton Mifflin Harcourt English 3D. Um, the participants were mainly um, uh, classroom teachers, but there were also in the trainings were administrators from each of the middle schools and the English learner specialists from each school. We used the adoption toolkit and specifically asked the questions related to LTEL adoptions. And um, we, have, we had a lot of data from the, from the questions, but ultimately it came down to what was the overall opinion of the curriculum. Uh, one is not good. Um, we don't have any five, which is purple, but we have a significantly larger percentage of green and, re and orange with English 3D. Um, we, had, we highlighted some of, the, some of the key aspects of English 3D. Um, well, for both curriculums, and there was significantly more for English 3D, specifically a lot of highly structured oral academic conversation, high interest, effective routines. Um, we even have some student comments about it helping. And overall, you can see that we get the vote on the right. It was unanimous um, with one abstention for someone who didn't end up implementing both curriculums. And overall, our teachers were excited to adopt um, English 3D as a curricular anchor. And so we make the recommendation, the PVUSD ELD pilot committee recommends that the PVUSD school board approve English 3D for sixth through eighth grade as the core LTEL ELD instructional material. Wow. Can I have a motion? Discussion? Any public speaking? Okay. Discussion from the board. I think we do have a couple questions. Um, so are you confident that this is, this will provide, well, uh, the program they piloted will provide students with the instruction that was necessary to help them reclassify sooner than later? Um, I'm going to go back to this slide right here on the left uh, is, is the components of what Kate Kinsella, who's the author of this, um, of this curriculum, says, as you see on the bottom, it's a curricular anchor. I do believe that is a solid curricular anchor in that it provides us with the opportunity, the base from which to build. We still need to continue with our professional development and our ongoing support of teachers so that they are able to access the materials and support their students with the appropriate scaffolds of when to provide those scaffolds, when to withdraw them. Um, and I also think that, that we need to continue, as you see, go up the administration training and support um, all the way through college visits. Um, so I, I kind of like that visual for that for that um, reason. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Um, what kind of feedback have you been getting from teachers and principals at these middle schools? Um, between the two, this, as you see, this was overwhelming support. And when we had the conversation, again, to, the, to, that, to that pyramid right there, um, with everything that we do, we want to make sure that we're not just dropping it in there and stepping back. Um, so we were talking yesterday with the provider, the, the guy that came out and, and did the trainings, about what opportunities we have to make sure that we um, have the continuation of that ongoing support, especially when we start implementing it to, um, to avoid that, that fatal mutation that happens sometimes in classroom or, or implementation. Um, and, so, and so that was part of the conversation. So it's not just dropped in, so that it is something that's an ongoing support. I was going to say, well, 
I saw this, I was like, well, wow, 100 professional learning videos that it has, 3D, pretty amazing. Um, but is, the, is there going to be in-person coaching that you kind of talked about in there? Is there going to be in-person coaching? I mean, yeah. is it going to be provided by somebody in... Well, the hope is to work with them, but also to build our capacity within. And that's one of the reasons that we made sure that the, um, the English learner specialists were at all of the trainings so that they can be the, um, and also a lot of, all, all the teachers that are going to be doing ELD at Pajaro Middle School, they were the, the main focus of the pilot. Um, they're the, they're going to be the front runners and they're going to, they're going to be practicing and learning. One, one thing that we talked about at the last training was we want to, we want to adopt, we want to, we want to be the trailblazers. And we also want to open our classes when we feel somewhat confident to, to start that. Let's let other, other teachers from around the district see, see the implementation that we're doing based on the support that we've gotten. Um, and then hopefully we can, we can build within and build our capacity with, them, with, our, with our ELSs, with, with our department, and then within the schools. So, I mean, right now you're saying that there's going to be maybe some coaches coming from the 3D or no? Yeah, so part of the package is that is that they come and they do the initial training and then there's on-site visits where they go into classrooms and they model and they, and they have done this with the pilot as well. They came in and they did some model lessons and then they did some on-site coaching and provided feedback. Okay, so that's good. And we can have our in-house people coming in there too. Yeah. Thank I you. Have, I do have one more question. Is this also a program that you're gonna be able to build on for other grade levels in uh, the future? The program itself uh, goes from fourth grade through, through eighth grade. Okay. Um, one thing that we do like about it is that it really emphasizes certain um, essential routines that part of the conversation was, what if we expanded those routines, not just in the ELD class, but throughout other content areas to try to solidify our integrated ELD throughout the schools? So not only are we looking at, yeah. at it really affecting ELD, but also integrated ELD beyond designated. Uh, a question, are these coaches consultants or teachers? The coaches from outside or yeah. from within? Uh, outside. The one that's been working mainly with us was a teacher and then was picked up by Harcourt um, or Hootmith on Harcourt. Thank you. Okay, any more discussion? So if not, can I have a second? Second. second. Mm. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, 7-0. Thank you very much. OK, now we're going to approve 9.6, and that's the approve the Summer Assistant Program Memorandum of Understanding between CSEA and Pajaro Valley Unified School District. <laughs> Report presented by Chona. Uh, thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. For your consideration, this is a summer school, a summer assistance program memorandum of understanding uh, between CSEA and PVUSD. When school is out for the summer recess, a number of our district employees are without work and without income. In June 2018, Governor Brown signed the 2018 to 19 state budget, which includes $50 million in funding for summer relief fund match one to one dollar by two dollar by the state. In November 2018, a memorandum of understanding was signed with the California School Associate Employees Association and PBUSD to participate in the Summer Relief Program. Um, approximately about 700 of our employees may be eligible to get uh, needed assistance during the summer, funding valued in excess of 1.5 million uh, from the state to participate in this program. <laughs> Okay, can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Oh, not yet. <laughs> this is how they do it. <laughs> Any public speakers? Okay, now discussion from the board. <laughs> is there any discussion from the board? I do. I have a comment and a question. So, first of all, I think this is an excellent resource uh, for our classified employees, so I am in full support. Um, I do have one question. If the employee chooses to participate in the program but decides not to work over the summer, are they able to, are there any repercussions for them? Are they able to get their money back, their contribution back without, um, without the matching funds? 
Um, the, the state has a formula for the eligible employees, so they have to apply. And it, um, there is a calculation for how much money they can make. So the requirements are they have to be uh, employed for less than 12 months and have been in our district for at least one year. And then there's a formula that is calculated and we are waiting for guidelines from, from um, CDE with regard to um, the calculation of who's eligible or not. Okay, so but let's say that they are eligible. Uh, based on that calculation, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, um, the employee um, cannot work over the summer, mm -hmm. would they be able to get their contributions back? Um, so it's actually the opposite. the opposite. So they have they can't work, um, but I get your point. Mm -hmm. So um, if they, the question I think we still need to answer, and I don't know the answer to the question, so we can find out for you, is whether or not if they contribute, then they decide to work then can they, I'm assuming they get it back, but the question is, is do they get any matching at all? Um, and we can find out. So if they do contribute, then um, the consideration is that they will not be doing summer work. Um, Got it, okay. Yeah. Oh, I thought I saw that they... No, it's so, so it's opposite. It's, it's to hold them over us. since they aren't getting pay. Right. But I, we will answer your question um, in that case. Thank you. I actually, just trying to, I have a question. Um, years back, um, the school district used to offer classified school employees who only, who didn't work the 12 month criteria, right? Um, they offered them to prorate their salary on a 10 month schedule or a 12 month schedule. Are we still doing that? Yes. And this will not interfere with that no. at all? No. Okay, thank you. Hi. Put this on. The next one's nine point seven. Approve MOU for the career technical education person. It's me again. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, you. President Osmondson, Board <laughs> Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, as per the memorandum of understanding in collaboration with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Our district desires to end its contract with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education for the provision of career technical education services. Towards the goal of college and career readiness for all students, we would like to implement a CTE pilot program commencing July 1, 2019 and ending no later than June 30th, 2021. Um, both um, PDFT and our district want to ensure that the positions for the CTE services are in the bargaining unit and shall negotiate a fair, appropriate, and competitive salary schedule for CTE teachers hired for these positions that we hope to present at the next board meeting, even if our PDFT team are tough negotiators. Um, there is a cost saving uh, associated with this action item, which we can put back to further strengthen our uh, CTE programs. Um, the county office, and Helen um, Belonzi, please uh, correct me if I misquote you. Um, county office currently charges $1.2 million to all districts participating in their CTE ROP programs, which PBUSD share, oh, which PBUSD share is $531,000 for the county management and oversight. Okay. <laughs> wow. So can I have a motion? So approval. <clears throat> okay, any public speakers? Discussion from the board. Uh, Georgia. So Chona or Dr. Rodriguez, either one. Um, I'm just trying to understand, so are we pulling out of that agreement with the County Office of Ed and they will no longer be running our CTE and ROP? That's accurate. That's, I, be, I think, to me, that's a bit concerning because I think that there are more opportunities provided to our students throughout the county by the sharing of the program through the County Office of Ed 
that things that maybe we can't offer here, that those students have the ability to go to a school in Santa Cruz and receive them, and vice versa. So it sounds like that relationship would be ending because you're saying we're going to end our collaboration with the County Office of Ed. That's not great. So currently, so what it boils down to is because of our ADA share, the grand majority of the money is coming from our district. However, when you look at what I call our proportional share, we are not um, we are not recognizing our our proportional share. So one thing that that money does give us is regional centers. However, if you look at the students who are currently in regional centers, not one of our students goes to a regional center that is not at one of our current schools. So our students do go from Watsonville High to PV High or PV High to Aptos High. They do go or Renaissance moves, um, but they do not go to any school site that is not our site. And that is because we have the programs down here. Um, the second thing is we have to look at quality of programming. We presented, um, Rob presented previously, Rob Hoffman presented on the number of courses who are currently singletons. That's important for us because that means that all of those courses do not count as a pathway. And so we've been working hard as a district to ensure that we have at least two courses in each pathway, um, sometimes three. Any, currently, we have a dicat, we have side by side in the same school, we have PVUSD teachers who are CTE teachers who are our teachers, and right next door we have, well, they finally changed it because I think I harped on them too much, ROP teachers or CTE um, county teachers that are together or working with the same kids but they're not really on the same playing field. And frankly, they don't have as much um, commitment to PVUSD because they're not our employees. So when we look at the fact that we have to strengthen our program, the question is, is are we getting the, the proportional share that we deserve? Um, and are we ensuring that we have the best programming possible? When we look at being able to save over $500,000 by taking it back to the district, um, that money we can use for many things, and that's it, we need it to improve our systems and the, and the support for our students. Um, so Santa Cruz County also is pulling out regardless of what we do. So regardless, what was going to happen is we were going to pay sixty thousand dollars of o of overhead. I mean, six. I'm sorry, six hundred thousand dollars worth of overhead to CDE. I mean, to the county. And because of the the number is all based on ADA, it was going to be forty thousand for San Lorenzo, Lorenzo Valley, and it was going to be around thirty eight thousand or so for Scotts Valley but we were gonna get the exact same services. We cannot continue to support districts that are not within our schools. Um, because when you, I, and as I told Scotts Valley, is the moment that I get, that we get the achievement of Scotts Valley, I will begin to worry about the district, the county as a whole. Right now, we have to look at how do we support our students, and the five-year MOU did not result in good results, and so we are trying to take it back. And for me, go ahead. Oh, uh, yes, for for discussion. <laughs> does um, by or taking the CTE program you know in house, does that give us more flexibility in what we offer through our CTE program? We, we, all, we always did have flexibility because we had a provision within the MOU that we could give them notifications that we no longer wanted coursework, so we could have. I think the, the point is, is that it will give us more flexibility just because we won't have to account for the, the overhead costs of another entity. Other questions? Did we, did we have a motion? Oh, good. 
That's so very good. I, I thought maybe I screwed up. <laughs> also, any more board of discussion? I, I do have a comment. Uh, I'm actually really excited that we're moving forward with implementing our own in-house pilot program. Mm, I think the board has been wanting that for quite a long time, and I think this is the uh, uh, a great opportunity to, to move in that direction. Um, I'm also in support of uh, having our CET teachers that we hire be uh, represented by, by PVFT. Um, my question is, are there any grant opportunities we're currently looking at to ensure that we're able to fully fund this pilot program? So yeah, so there's um, the workforce um, development funds that we're actually going after as we speak um, that will help continue to support. We also have Perkins and CTIG funding, um, which we receive. So there's actually quite a bit, both federal and state funding that's coming down in order to support um, CTE pathways um, because it's a, it's a core focus um, nationally. And we're going after those grant fundings. Great, thank you. Five Board minutes of, yeah, group. Oh, do you have a, something to say? Oh, that was five minutes for group discussion. Okay, okay, that's good, <laughs> good. Okay, what? Oh, she, she has a comment, but she's not supposed to, she's got to really hurry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I'm guessing the County Office of Education is not happy about us pulling, at, or nor Santa Cruz, because that's a sizable amount of money, right? Um, so can you just, in a nutshell, discuss how we intend to um, use the 500000 that we normally would be paying or, to improve the to improve pathways, programs? Right. So I think all that money can, we have already the pathways developed that we want to do over the next three years. So I think we're able to reinvest that, those monies, both in facilities, in teaching staff, in um in different programming that we have for our students. So we want to begin internship certifications and we want to do dual enrollment with our students. Um, so it allows us to do it. I will note that we are still deficit spending, right? Um, so this is another way in which we're able to, we talk about efficiencies all the time with me. So this is another way to look at efficiency so that we're not spending money that we don't need to be spending so we can spend it where we need to spend it. Okay, thank you. Okay, did I get a second? I'll second. I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Okay, Abstain. six. Oh, how do I say this? It's kind of one, one. Five, five, one, one. Five, one, one. Five, one, one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to ask, and this one is a career technical education teacher, and this was career technical education. I thought there was a coordinator too. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so we, so we're doing 9.8 first career technical education teacher. Okay. Oh, that was just for career. Okay, Chona Keeley. Here we go again. Um, <laughs> President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, for your consideration, this is the job description for the career technical education teacher, which was developed with uh, PBFT. The position's critical to our efforts uh, to implement an in-house CTE pilot program. Among the essential functions of the CTE uh, teacher are to plan, prepare, implement a quality comp competency-based CTE program aligned with state standards and district requirements, leading to the development of student skills sufficient to qualify for entry-level employment and or post-secondary education using innovative, relevant, and effective instructional strategies with all students. Okay, can I have a motion? I'll move to approve the career technical education teacher no job public, description. No public comment, right? Okay, for discussion. Anybody for discussion? <laughs> yeah, I feel like the next one I'll discuss. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And so she's not here. So it's, that's. 
Oh, and he opposed, but he Aye. opposed. Aye. Here, opposing. So it's six, five, five one, one. one. So five, one, one, one. Yeah. Who seconded? I think. I know I can't remember. Who Rewind the two seconds. First and second. So who first and seconded? I did one of them. I think I moved, didn't I? You did. Who did seconded? I don't think we moved. Yeah, you need me to redo the vote. Yeah, let's redo it. Okay. So I moved. I moved to approve the career technical education teacher job description. Second. Okay. Now, now all those in favor. Aye. 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 All those opposed. Aye. And so it's five one one. <clears throat> Okay, now we're doing 9.9 .9, Career Technical Education Coordinator, and it's still Chona. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, uh, President Osmondson. This job description is for the Career Technical Education Coordinator, um, very critical to our efforts um, to implement the in-house CTE pilot program and make sure that we promote college and career readiness for our students. Under the direction of the assistant superintendent, the coordinator will oversee the planning, organizing, monitoring of the operations, activities of the integrated career technical education program and assure that program activities comply with established laws, rules, regulations, and grant specifications. Um, they will monitor um, operations to enhance program effectiveness, supervise and evaluate the performance of assigned staff, assist in the development of programs, curriculum, and policies and procedures, collaborate with other departments on grants, um, provide technical expertise and information and assistance uh, to staff, and prepare a variety of narrative and statistical reports. Wow. <laughs> OK, so do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the coordinator for career and technical education. This is item 9.9. .9. OK, let me, so there's no, no, no community. Yeah. Um, okay, so board discussion on this one. <laughs> I, I was going to ask that, you know, you've already given a good reason. I was going to ask for, you know, the community and the, maybe even the TV that, you know, for the reasons why this position is so important. But you did answer a lot of that when you were talking about it. So I'm, I feel kind of comfortable that you answered it enough for the community and probably TV. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Second. Oh, I, was, oh, I forgot the, about the second. I'll second. <laughs> there you go. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Five, one, one. <clears throat> Okay, 9.10, a response to Watsonville Prep School, which is the Navigator School. Okay. It's Proposition 39 request, facilities request. Okay, so um, I am going to be presenting on the Proposition um, 39 facilities um. request for Watsonville Prep School. Um, one thing I want to, so first I just want to do a quick overview so that people understand our responsibilities when it comes to Prop 39. So when it comes to the intent of Prop 39, it is that we shall share equal, um, fairly among all public school pupils. Um, technically, charter schools are considered um, public school students. Um, and so to have eligibility, um, then they must have these, these criteria. So one, they had to do a timely request. That means that they had to request it before November 1st. Um, they had to submit that petition prior to that time. Um, they had to have an approved charter school no later than March 15th. Um, and then they had to have at least 80, peop um, 80 students or ADA that they were going to have in order to be able to even request um, Prop 39 um, facilities. So when you think about the type of facilities that we have to require, um, there's three main things that we have to think of. One is that it's reasonably equivalent. 
Um, so we had to take into comparison what our comparison schools were. Um, it also, we had to look at size, type of space, and condition um, in order to be able to do that. There is, a, there is a contingency that it has to be contiguous, meaning it's, it's in one spot, right? Um, and so it needs to be contained in one school site or immediately adjacent to the school site unless there are extreme circumstances. And that's what it says. Under certain circumstances, it can be allocated in more than one school site, but you have to be able to substantiate that you have no um, location. Um, it also needs to be furbished and equipped um, with um, classroom instructional materials or furnishings similar to what our students would receive um, in our schools. Um, and so when we talk about it, um, we have to not only provide classrooms, which is called teaching stations, but we also have to provide um, specialized space and non-teaching space. So that <coughs> is where when we talk later on about the space that we're considering, um, we have to provide administrative space, kitchen, multi-purpose room, and play area space in each location um, that is provided. Um, and so um, when we look at the timeline, this is the timeline of where it is. Um, as I had mentioned to, to many of you, um, th this is the first offer. So as we had talked before, they had to request by November 1st, they did that. Um, we had to issue our objections um, to their ADA projections, which we're going to talk about in a minute. We had to do that by December 1st, which was done. Um, the charter school then had to respond to our ADA projections, um, which they had to do by January 12th, which they did. Um, we're currently in the phase, that's why it says here we are, um, currently in the phase of our preliminary offer for facilities um, by February 1st. Um, and then they must respond back to us by March 1st. And we must offer, issue our final offer in space on April 1st. Um, so the goal of tonight is for you to be aware of the written preliminary offer that we are going to be providing to them and then receive feedback and input from board prior to um, the required um, preliminary offer on February 1st. So when we, just a little timeline, I know we all know this, but um, they submitted the request. They did seek space for 196.32 students um, at the K-2 at the K-2 level, uh, or the TK-2 level. Um, although the charter school was, the petition was only for kinder through second grade students. So it was not actually for TK students. Um, we did submit our objections by December 1st. We went through the enrollment forms. We found duplicates. We found students who were not within grade levels to be served for the 1920 school year. For example, maybe there was a fourth grader. They don't. They won't be doing fourth grade this first year. Um, and then students who did not reside within the district boundaries um, because they they must do that. Um, the district also noted that. And we believe that their projections will be impacted by the by the fact that it's a new school and that they lack transportation. Currently, 17% of all of our general education students and 12% of all of our special needs students um, will not do not uh, use transportation daily. Um, so, based on the review, we continue to believe that the determine that the district ADA projection of 113 is viable considering that it is a K-2 school and all the other factors um, that we have done. Um, because of that, um, so the, in preparation of the preliminary offer, we had to do significant work in order to be able to do that. So what we have, they have frequently referenced Minty White and they have frequently referenced Radcliffe. So those were the two, co the two comparison schools that we did when we looked at um, the type of conditions that they should be in and also the type of space that our current students have. Um, the district evaluated facilities throughout the city of Watsonville. That was a, prefer a preferred location for Watsonville Prep School. Um, and we evaluated the current, the potential cost of locating them on a single site. Um, so with the projected ADA of 113, 
Um, we look at every single elementary school. If you look at our report, which is on there, um, we currently have um, almost 20. It is a little bit less than previously, but this year alone, we have almost 20 teachers who, are we, who we are paying a roving stipend to. That means that we don't have enough elementary classrooms for our own teachers. So we do not have one space, um, which is highlighted and proven by the fact that we've been doing stipends now for two years and we have teachers who are roving. So we have none. Um, the only school site which we have um, portables for um, is at EA Hall. Um, the reason, and I do wanna make this clear, the reason why we actually have those portables is because with Major L, we added a wing and those portables were to be removed um, because Major L was very specific with the fact that it was to replace current, um, current facilities and not to add on facilities. So we were slated to actually take those portables, all seven of them, out of EA Hall this next year, or actually this summer. So we, we were slating it originally for um, a winter break um, because of um, lack of communication with the teachers. We, we stopped that and that, and we wound up doing or planning on doing it during the summer break. Um, but so for us to be able to use them, we do have to do some improvements to those portables um, because currently they're, they're slated to come out. Um, but basically what we would do when you look at, um, um, and I'll go back to this in one second, but when you look at it, so this is the whole school site right here, and it's hard for you to see my little pin, but if you look at the far right, and you see the seven highlighted boxes, those are the portables. So what is being proposed so that we do not interfere with EA Hall, and we also provide security for the K2 students um, from Watsonville Prep School, is there would be a fencing that goes out the opposite way towards the, um, towards the road. Um, so they would not actually interact with the children um, that are on the other side, which is um, EA Hall. The, if you look at the very top, so you can kind of see the red dot, if you look at the very top, that's where their space for play would be. So they would have, you see the red lines, mm -hmm. they would have all of this space up here, and then they would have that. We would also add a portable bathroom. It sounds, it's not a porta body, it sounds bad, mm -hmm. but it is, exact, it is exactly what Alianza charter school has and what Wixa has. So it's a portable which is made specifically for being a bathroom and um, that would go right here. Um, what, would, what would be joint use is that they would, and there would be a gate right here, they would use the cafeteria at times when, for, for food, when um, times when EA Hall is not present in those rooms. So going back to this slide, what we would do is we would share um, use of scheduling and coordination. So we would be working with them to where there was no intersection um, between the students. Um, and then there is also the pro rata share cost of the allocated facilities and then routine maintenance and, um, and utilities. So originally we, um, as I mentioned to some of you, um, we, there was various options that we were looking at. Once we looked at ensuring that we had the least impact to our staffs and least impact to our students, um, this was the only option which we could do that allowed us to provide all of the locations that we need. So when we think about the requirement of having to give teaching stations, specialized space, and non-teaching space. Um, the only location that we found um, was those seven portables at EA Hall. So I open it up for questions. Michelle, are they planning on just doing K through two? Is that what they're saying to start off with? To start off, yes. Okay, but they want to expand it all the way to eighth grade? That is correct. 
question. Um, I live in the area, and the mass two weeks I've been talking to Lee White, Lee Hall, Radcliffe too. And I know for a while traffic has always been an issue. And how would traffic and parking and bus stops and what, is anything going to be done about that or for the city? Yeah, so um, bell schedules will be important. So the bell schedules will be important. Um, it will, we will work hand in hand with them to ensure that they start early enough to where we do not have coinciding bell schedules with the other. It will behoove them and us um, to not have coinciding bell schedules. So the goal will be to get them in and out um, or in and I call them tucked in, right? In and into the classrooms um, before the other two schools are in process. It will also need to happen because lunches will have to happen earlier. Um, another question being, what happens if the charter school decides we don't need to go with your program? I mean, I'll still join everything. Yeah, um, so that's part of the negotiation that goes back and forth. Um, so that's why we put it in this um, preliminary offer. So these are provisions that we can include. So we, so we, of course, will work alongside them, but we actually have the ability to um, dictate um, scheduling and coordination, and we also have can require them to do routine maintenance and utilities and their pro rata share. One more question. One more question. Um, I know the city met in closed session yesterday during your city council meeting. Um, do we know anything what the city is doing the charter school? Yeah, so I did have communication with the city manager, but because it was a closed session item, he couldn't give me information. Um, I know that we do have charter the Watsonville um, charter school here, and so they may provide us additional information. Um, I know from um, work with um, the pastor at the Presbyterian Church, they are um, having conversations with them, and they're also having conversations regarding the Porter Building. Our obligations are to continue with um, the timeline until they determine that, um, or if they determine that they don't need our facilities. Okay, on the motion. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the okay. Prop 39 offer. No discussion from the public. Yep. Thank you. Kirsten Carr, are you still here? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm vertically challenged. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, board trustees and Superintendent Rodriguez, and congratulations, Trustee DeSerpa. As someone who turns 50 next month, ripe old age of 51, no, it's the new 30. We're all good. Um, I am truly honored to be standing here as a future member of the Watsonville educational community. The staff and parents of Watsonville Prep School are so looking forward to the first day of school in August and the thought we might be able to do it at a site at the core of Watsonville is even more exciting. Although there are a few points of concern to still be discussed, this offers a good first step towards the collaboration we are committed to. As many of you heard at the state board meeting, which was a very long day, as you guys referenced, the, um, the possibility of district charter, public charter partnerships is of importance to all of them, as well as just being beneficial to the students of California. Working together is not only at the core of who we are as navigators, it is crucial to continuing the academic progress we are all interested in pursuing. Thank you for your time and interest in providing these Prop 39 facilities. So discussion for the board. Now I would like to second the motion. Okay, so we can, all those in favor Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. I'm going to abstain. Which one? You. Jordan. Okay. So we'll take care of one. Okay. Now I'm on 10, which we're going to go on to report and discussion, not action. 
10.1 is the first reading of board policy update 5145.9 hate motivated behavior and these are most of them are going to be done by Michael Burmes <laughs> most of them <laughs> hello again I'm president president Osmondson board of trustees and dr. Rodriguez um, in anticipation of federal program monitoring coming soon, we are taking the opportunity to review our policies and administrative regulations and are updating policies based on the passage of various bills. Before you, you have 10 policies and ARs. Um, and this is the first reading of these policies, therefore they will, there will be no vote um, this evening. The second reading and the vote will be in the next board meeting. Um, if you do have feedback and changes that you wish to make, regarding these policies, please uh, communicate those to Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez prior to the Friday before next board meeting um, so we can ensure that they're included. Um, for these items, the black text is language in our current policy and the red text reflects CSBA policy changes based on the passage um, of new bills and ed code. The first one is hate motivated behavior. And, the la and there's language change to define hate motivated behavior and expand um, the material related to collaboration, staff training, and enforcement of rules regarding student conduct. It also links it more directly to the UCP uniform complaint procedures. Any questions or comments from the board? Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so sometimes we have board policies that are um, very much personalized to us. In the case of what you're seeing here, the majority of them are just ensuring that we're applying the new um, laws and regulations that we must abide by. So most of this language, if not 100% of it, um, has very little wiggle room because it's taken directly from CSBA gamut. So they provide, they through um, legal counsel provide the interpretation of what our board policy should look like um, with the new laws, and then this is what comes up. So I just want to mention that so that people are aware if they want to know where this came from, it came from CSBA gamut, and it's really just ensuring that we're abiding by the laws. Okay, so no more discussion from the board, right? Okay. Um, we're now going to do 10.2, first reading of board policy, update 5145.7. And this one, again, changes based on passage of bills and changes in ed code. This one pertains to sexual harassment. Um, and this one specifies that we must take interim measures to ensure safety of any student complaint of um, or victim of sexual harassment, um, and it includes a, man, a mandated administrative regulation. And it also includes off-campus sexually harassing conduct must be addressed. Okay, comments from the board. Jennifer. On Jen. the, the first red line item where it says the board prohibits at school or at school-sponsored or school-related activities, but it also says that again in the same sentence that school or school sponsored or school related activities do do we need to have it in both places like no that? and that was we saw that and in the second in the in the second read that's already been deleted thank you okay Kim um, I'd like to see the actual definition of sexual harassment in one of these policies because you've given examples in all the other board policies of the conduct Definitely. that you don't want to see except in this particular policy. There might be a de definition in the next it. one, but we yeah. can look at it maybe add it in. Yeah, I just one. noticed that it wasn't laid out very clearly because there's sexual harassment, there's sexual assault, there's, you know, there's like a continuum of sexual behaviors we do not want to see with, between, you know, students, in, staff, everybody, right? So, and so, so it needs to be very specific. In the next um, 
the next one has three more board policies to it. Mm -hmm. And so this one pertains to um, students, and the next three pertains to in the work environment. And in that one, in the administrative regulation, there is a definition. Um, and then if you like, we can maybe add it to the, 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 the first one. Yeah, that sounds good to add it. Okay, so 10.3, uh, these are updates from the board policies. I think they're, I guess, BPAR, 4119.11, 4219.11, 4319.11. And this is three and one, they're all the same, but they each pertain, four one pertains to classified, four two pertains to certificate, and four three pertains to administrative. I believe, don't quote me on that one. Um, and this one is particular to the new law SB 396, sexual harassment in the workplace. Okay, so that's three. Okay, any comments from the board? No. Okay, this is 10.4. This is the first reading, they're all first readings of BPAR 514313, response to immigration enforcement. And this new policy relates to the new law AB 699 and the additional new law SB 31, specifically about the response to immigration enforcement in our schools. Um, so I did want to mention that this is linked to our board policy 511.3. So we actually did a board policy regarding response to immigration enforcement off of a resolution that we had. We were before our time. So we were before <laughs> we our were. time, which was it became law that we had an administrative regulation. So we actually, so this is new. Um, but I did want to mention that we were front runners because we actually had a board policy prior to it being required with a different number that CSBA gave us. So I just wanted to mention that. We certainly did. <laughs> I was just going to say on there, I noticed that it said that they could have a verbal or written request. And I thought, I thought to myself, can't we just say we don't provide that information, period? I mean, verbal, written, what's, can we say that we don't, excuse me, we don't provide that information? Can't we just say that to them? It, it has in here that something about they can have a verbal or written request. We, and the, you mean for access to Im information? Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the verbal or written request triggers the process that, that this and other um, new policies lay out. Okay. So, yeah. I just have a quick question. So this applies whether um, they request uh, this information from us in the district or whether the student may be or students may be at a, at a bus stop. And so, so I just want to make sure, because this is board policy, we, ha we have to follow it, right? So I just want to make sure that when we are approving these policies, that all that information and protocols to follow uh, are trickled down to, you know, the parent, to the student, right. to the bus drivers, to everyone that has some sort of contact with Teachers. our students. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so maybe I'm not sure if there's, you know, some sort of training that goes, th that we have in place for this type of situation. Um, but yeah, right. yeah, because this is just, you know, a, such a sensitive matter, at least in our community. Right. And I think we, we need to provide a little closer attention, possible training uh, when we do approve um, this bylaw. Yeah, we definitely can look into trainings. What we did when we first um, provided, did our first board policy is we made sure and sent it out to what we call PV all, which is every single employee of the school district um, so that they are aware of it. And people are very appreciative of it. If you remember from our resolution, it was at the time where there was quite a bit of ex um, concern and excitement over it. People wanted to know, well, how, what do I, how do I tell them you can't go on campus, right? So then we did the board policy for us so that people would have something in writing to be able to show law enforcement and say, no, you can't come here. You have to go to the superintendent's office. And this is why. 
Um, but we can definitely look into training. I think basically what this is saying is you just won't disclose any information. And so um, most people um, that would have that information, um, we've trained, but we can look at making sure that everyone's aware. And just, and just in general, a, a communication about most of these policies this time and next. Um, we are doing a lot of the policy changes that are, that are being proposed um, and compiling the notes of the ones that we, that we need to look at for future changes. Can I put provide student film in my written description? Oh. First reading BPAR 5143.3, non discrimination and harassment. And the changes here are minor revisions mostly, and, and a lot of them have to do with language, specifically a, the passage of AB um, 699, which was cited above um, regarding uh, immigrant students and immigration status. Any discussion by the board? Okay. Um, this is 10.6, first reading update policy AR 6159.4, behavior interventions for special education students. Good evening. Just because of the odd person, I thought I would break it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> not, a, not everything's fine. I was going to say almost Michael Berman every time, almost. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, this is uh, related to Assembly Bill 2657 that was approved by the governor in September um, on September, September 30th. Um, the bill discusses behavioral restraints and seclusion, when they can be used and when they're prohibited. The bill also requires the local educational agency, the LEA, to collect um, data and no later than three months after the end of the school year report th this data to the state of education on an annual um, basis. And then we're looking at the rules and regulations around when you can use restraint or seclusion with any student, but specifically students with special needs or on 504 plans. Discussion by the board. I mean, all I can say is I hope we never use it. I mean, it sounds, you know, just reading the whole thing about it, it sounds like, whoa, pretty, you know, I'm hoping that it never, ever has to happen. That's all I can say. And, and part of it is, you know, looking at if it's eminent danger, and that's like the language that they use. But Eminent danger to themselves or other people. Yeah. And um, mm. the other thing that we have trained, you know, our district with is the with what? Safety therapists, I'm sorry, I can't keep saying it, but, but you know, we do have staff that is trained. Uh huh. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where, where am I? <laughs> okay. Uh, 10.7, first reading update BP 5146, married parent parenting students. Um. And this one was written by Lisa, but it pertains to the new law AB 302, specifically requiring students to offer reasonable accommodations to any lactating students on campus. And I just want to say that we actually, before this went into effect, or before it was even mentioned, we have been doing that with all of our students and supporting all breastfeeding coalitions, as well as uh, Breast is Best when available or when um, needed by students and so everything when I originally was asked to write a statement about what we were doing and then we saw the law we were meeting it if not a hundred percent a hundred and twenty five percent yeah I mean I was gonna say we already have a program here I mean they were talking about going to the outside and having programs for 
parents, I mean, for either parents or mothers or whatever, but we do have a program here. We have a parent, whatever it's called, parenting. What is it's, it's called? What's Pregnant and Parenting uh, Student Program. Yeah. It serves all of our school sites, and the students actually stay at their comprehensive school site or their uh, whichever school site they're at, and we support the services through the school site. Yes, that's what I thought. I thought. <laughs> all right. Any more board dis board discussion? Yeah, Jen. I just had one question because in the introduction it says that the programs uh, that are offered separately have to be equal. There is a, a, instead of comparable, there is a line in the policy where it says comparable. Do, do we need to update that or is comparable acceptable in that? It's, it, it is um, acceptable and we've actually um, made sure that it is comparable across the board. And, then, and we did that before that ever became policy at the state level. Uh, making sure we are following all fe federal regulations. And then we have also this year made sure that the program meets the requirement that any program that we offer to a teen parent is also available to a non-teen parent, pregnant parent student. Thank you. And, then, but. and that, that was another item that we saw um, and we've already changed for the second read. Mm -hmm. You got two points. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, 10.8, first reading update, BP 1250, Visitors, Outsiders. Um, one of the main updates is specific language about individuals causing disruptions and sex offenders requesting to be present on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then... And it had all the policies, how people have to come in and have to, they have to, have, you know, what they need to do when they go into the office and blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. So did everybody read that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the next one is 10.9, first reading update BP 0410, non-discrimination in district programs and activities. Um, again, this was affected by the, the new law, AB 699, and also the SB 31, um, regarding specific language to um, all, all of our students. Okay. And, you know, non-discrimination, that's good. 10.10, um, .10, first reading, BP and AR 6145.2, athletic competition. Um, new law AB 2009 um, and um, AB 2800 um, have language that is now in here. Read it then. So any any comments? I have a question. So in the past, some um, athletic programs have charged a little money for this or that, and that's now clearly outlined in the policy that that's unacceptable, correct? Um, I believe so. Okay. Well, I'm, I, I'm not certain on that. There might be conditions where that's not the case. Yeah. No, they cannot. Um, is that going to impact any types of athletic budgets that we know about? I mean, the, the um, PTAs and boosters and everything can still do fundraising as groups, right, in order to, to fund. Them. Right, and they can also do, so So I guess when I said they cannot charge, they cannot charge for within the school year activities. They can charge for like summer ball because that is not required, although if you're an athlete, you will think it's required. Um, it's not required mm -hmm. and um, it is not within the school year. Um, most school sites um, have supports for through the boosters um, for students that cannot um, because of the board's previous stance and my stance that um, we're not going to limit students due to their financial 
situation, um, sites have um, provided scholarships for kids or provided the funding for kids. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to have it for the consent agenda. Can I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda, and I'd like to pull item 11.5. Or actually, let me ask for some clarification. So I'm on the board of ETR. Um, and I need to abstain from the vote, I think, for 11.5. So I pull it, and then we'll vote on it later. Okay, thank you. Okay, second. so. Second. And we concur. Okay, a second. I second. I will call a vote for, the, for all of the rest of them. <laughs> the consent items. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's 7-0. Um, so now we do 11.5. Mm -hmm. um, we can go ahead and vote on it, and she can abstain. <laughs> so we need a motion for 11.5. No second. A second. Okay, all those in favor of 11.5? Aye. 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 Okay, I abstain. Abstain. Abstentions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we're going to just do the closed session. Let's take what time is it? <coughs> the consent conversation. Okay. I have to say it. I need to say it in here. We're going to do closed session. We'll do expulsions first. Okay. Uh, for student number 1819-006, um, the board moved for, with the recommendation of the school administration for full expulsion for the remainder of the 2018-2019 school year with a 601 vote. For number um, 1819-007, the board moved um, to approve the recommendation of the, the school administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the 1819 school year with a 601 vote. And lastly, for number 1819-008, the board moved to, um, to approve the recommendation of the school administration with a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 1819 school year with a 601 vote. Okay, Danny. I move to approve the PBUSD cert certificated personal report as present on January 23rd, 2019, number 257, add one additional action and one correction from the December 12th, 2018 board meeting. Do I have a motion? Pete just made the motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Seven zero. Classified personnel report. I move to approve the PBUSD classified personnel report as present on January 23rd, 2019, with 160 and two additional action items. Um, do I have a motion? Yeah. Oh, oh, you do motion. Okay. Just need a second. Well, I'm sorry. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Seven. Okay, so the upcoming meetings, I know, uh, our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be held on Wednesday, February 13, here. And I'm going to close the meeting. <laughs> Is that how I do it? <laughs>